Testing, testing, one, two, three. Morning. Hi, Sean. How are you? Good, Tom. How are you doing? Very good, thanks. How's it going on? Okay, let me see. Pull this up. Okay, that's great. Okay, so hopefully everybody, uh, it's been a couple of weeks, I guess, uh, since we really, <laughs> uh, so hopefully everybody was doing okay, got a little bit of uh, a break, and then you had the test, which probably didn't give you much of a break, so uh, probably didn't seem that way. I don't know, it didn't seem like much of a break to me either. Usually, usually it does, but this time it didn't. <laughs> All right, um, so what I wanted to do today was, uh, I'm gonna go over a few things from the, uh, from the uh, video lectures that I sent out, but then I wanna spend a little bit of time at the end for the assignment. So any, I wanna, so anybody that's thinking of questions that they want or they wanna ask, uh, maybe in the next little bit, I won't do that till towards uh, the last half of the lecture. Uh, but uh, you can think, ponder it in the meantime and write down some um, questions and that way I can help. And that way it also saves me 500 emails. <laughs> Trying to be smart on this. Uh, so yeah, and um, I'm sure there's also a lot of people that they have not had group people respond and that sort of thing. Um, so I'm at the point now where if somebody has not responded to your group uh, up to this point, I would just, if they all of a sudden show up out of nowhere, send them to me and I'll deal with them separately. Um, Cause I think it's too late now at this point, all of a sudden for somebody to show up that they haven't participated or done anything, unless you as a group feel, cause you're late at it, that it's okay, then that's fine with me. But I think I don't want you to put, uh, uh, have people in your group that didn't do anything, you know what I mean? So um, uh, if that's the, if that's kind of the consensus, then you can send them to me and I'll figure out something uh, alternative thing for them to do. I don't necessarily cast everybody out. It's just uh, uh, some people procrastinate too long, I think, especially with online. So um, I'm learning to figure out different things for that. Uh, but uh, yeah, and so then uh, maybe by the end of this week, if there's anybody that uh, then you've, you've decided, well, our group really is only these three people, uh, you can uh, send that to me and then where I can go through the groups and just sort of take those ones that aren't out of the group so that then at least I know what I'm dealing with as far as trying to help them in a different way. Um, so we can deal with it that way. I don't want somebody else's problem to become the, the group's problem at this point. Uh, but as I said, you know, if it's like, well, we're late at this too. So yeah, more the mer merrier. Well, that's fine. You can deal with it that way as well. So I'll give you that option. Um, okay. So as I said, I'll, I'll start out and I'll do a little bit of uh, what the video uh, recordings were on this week. And then we'll get into talking about the uh, assignment. There's a few things in the video recording that kind of after I did it, I thought, oh, I should should do this. I should say this. I should say this, and that's okay because I can do it now, right? Um, so uh, I'm just going to go to the lecture, and I think as 
Can you see that on the screen now, the PowerPoints? Okay. All right, so I think uh, chapter 11 of your textbook really is about building systems. And so it's really a, about um, the, the systems that you have uh, in a house. And we have a lot of systems in our house. We have, you know, our electrical systems, we have our plumbing systems, we have our heating ventilation air conditioning systems. That's what HVAC stands for. And more and more uh, than ever, they also kind of integrate with each other. You know, you can uh, operate your thermostat uh, from uh, another continent if you want to. Um, so uh, they definitely uh, integrate depending on uh, how sophisticated your system is. And it does tie also a lot with uh, sort of the movement to more sustainable, sustainable construction, all right? Um, so it does uh, tie to um, that. Um, Graham just put a chat note, which is true course enrollment for semester two opens um, November 26th at noon. So I guess they'll have the schedules finalized for that by then. Actually, I thought it was sooner, but I guess it's not till November 26th. Okay. Uh, so we have our uh, building systems. And so there are two systems uh, that I talk about in the first video was the uh, plumbing and HVAC systems. And of course, this has been a question I've been getting on the assignment, uh, especially I think uh, on the construction, uh, we'll talk about it later, but you know, an organizational chart is something like this. This is actually a project chart, more or less the reporting structure for a particular um, project, right? It's not, this is not that sophisticated or necessarily complete, but it definitely gives you the idea for a typical design bid build kind of contract. So this would be more um, structured if you want to think about it. Maybe you think that, oh, I want to build a custom home. So you go, you buy the property, you're the homeowner, so you're the owner. And then you say, okay, well, I want to, I want to build a custom home. So maybe you then go to a architect, generally in our contracts referred to as a consultant, right? Um, we could do it under different contract types. We could go to a construction manager that we want to oversee the project. It could be different ones, but in this case, let's assume it's an architect, right? Uh, that's probably the most typical custom home. And I hire them and they do a design that's gonna fit the house on my property, kind of like the stuff we talked about um, near the beginning that was in um, chapter five uh, where you have to get a permit. So they have to do a design that is going to um, fit the property, fit the zoning requirements, et cetera. But they're also gonna do up a set of drawings and specifications that people can bid on the project. So they'll, they'll, if they're hired by the owner for more than just the design, because the owner could just hire them for the design. But if they're hired for more than the design, they will also take care of soliciting bids and reviewing the bids with the actual owner to determine if who's the best uh, contractor to do the project. And being a private project, it doesn't necessarily go to the lowest um, bidder, right? Because you're the homeowner. It's like maybe you don't get a good vibe from one of the contractors. And so maybe you want to go with a different contractor, even though they may be a little bit more expensive. If it's government type projects, it's going to go to the lowest bidder. But this kind of residential project, because they're pre-qualified really hard, the contractors, and it takes a lot of time and effort. But if it's private, um, it just depends. At the end of the day, though, a contractor will be assigned to the uh, project and there'll be a contract between the owner and the general contractor. So the owner and the general contractor. Uh, there's also a contract between the owner and the consultant. You know, what is the consultant doing for the owner? Are they just doing the designs? Are they just doing the design and the bid process? Are they doing the design bid process and monitoring the construction work? So that would be in that contract. And they're kind of acting if they're monitoring the work and they're helping the owner review and who is going to be hired, they're acting like a um, third party agent almost uh, in the sense that they're acting in the owner's interest in the contract between the contractor and the owner. So the contractor is gonna be you know, 
uh, the work of the contractor is going to be reviewed and inspected by the architect, as well as, of course, the building department inspectors and all of that kind of stuff to make sure it's satisfying their requirements. The general contractor then hires all of the subcontractors. And in my video, I mentioned that these are not um, all of them, obviously. There could be like 30 of them, 25 of them, depending on who you're contracting the work with, right? Uh, so some of them may have their own subcontractors, right? So that's a possibility. Uh, so some of them may have their own subcontractors. So this hierarchy here, this org chart for the project really would sort of show, well, if I'm the plumbing sub and I wanna get a drain sub uh, to do the drain work and the drain sub subs to an excavation company to excavate where the, the sanitary and storm drains are going to be uh, connected, then the drain sub is directing the work of the excavation sub, right? And the plumbing sub is directing the work of the drain sub. So in other words, the, the, it's kind of the reporting structure follows through here. It shouldn't be that this sub, the owner comes on site and starts telling this sub what to do, right? That's a, a, a formula for chaos. Um, so you wanna make sure that the reporting structure is understood, right? And so also, you know, the plumbing sub doesn't start making side deals with the owner. If there's a change, it goes through the general contractor. And then that change gets uh, reviewed by the architect. They discuss it with the owner, and then it gets signed off and it gets added to the actual contract amount. So, you know, if we're talking about an org chart, that's for a project. Now, I think in the other uh, assignment, um, it, it may be that I asked for an org chart uh, for, um, I may ask for the org chart for the, uh, for the um, business itself. Well, that's different. So then that's your business. And then how do you organize yourself? Do you have an estimator? Do you, and how big are you, right? If it's a commercial project and you're a bigger entity, it could be much more complex. If you're a smaller company, it probably is not so uh, complex. You're going to have you know, your estimating team, you're going to have your, uh, your project managers, your site supers, your project coordinators, it's going to be a little bit more simplified in that way uh, than a very large entity might be. Uh, you know, a large entity is going to have a, a vice president of human resources, they're going to have the probably the vice president of estimating, they're going to have the uh, vice president of marketing, they're going to have a bunch of different, and then through that, it's going to flow the org chart as well. It's not the end of the day for this assignment. I'm just asking you to hypothesize what that business structure would be. And I'm talking about like the Wednesday assignment when we're talking about the commercial project it would be a little bit maybe more uh, complex. But I'm just asking you to think that through. And if it's an org chart, because I've been getting a lot of emails, what's an org chart? It kind of looks like this kind of aspect and who reports to who. This is a project-based one. So this is, and this is, this is very typical of what we call design, bid, build, lump sum type project, right? Um, so this is very typical of that. And that's probably the most common methodology um, used for, projects overall. So just wanted to spend a little bit of time on that because I don't think it was as clear maybe in the, the video. So I sort of added that. Is there any questions on that? So sorry, Prof, just to reiterate, this is the construction structure, the one that's on the screen right now, that would be more appropriate for the residential project, whereas the um, business structure is more appropriate for the introduction project, is that correct? No, um, this, this is more for the project itself. So this is for a project itself because for a project itself, I've got the owner, I've got a consultant, I've got a general contractor, I got all these subcontractors. For a business, it's just like who works for me, only who works for me. So this is like a project, you know, and then this general contractor, if I was to do a separate org chart, I would just take another page. I would have general contractor, right? And then I might have senior estimator or vice president of estimating. So an org thing would go out for that. Then I would have my project manager. 
then I'd have my site super and I would have it go out from that. And then underneath, who's reporting to the site super? Is it the project coordinator, right? So who are the people that work directly for me is a business org chart. A project org, org chart is how does this project get built and what are the relationships between the people a lot of different companies here, a lot of different companies, right? Each one of these boxes is a different company. And then you've got the owner as well, and you've got your own company, right? So this would be, and this could work, this design bid build, it could be for residential, it could be for commercial, it could be for a whole host of different types of, uh, of uh, construction work. But an org chart for a construction company, specifically that company, would be who works for that company. Is that clear, uh, Perditi? Yeah, it's Perditi. Um, and Perditi. also, Perditi. thank you. Um, and so in terms of the course requirements, I mean, the assignment requirements, um, this, so it's the org chart in general, right? Well, we'll talk, we'll go through the assignment and then we'll point to the different points in the assignment later. All right, so, and if I miss it somehow, Praditi, uh, let me know. Okay, thank you. Okay, because yeah, I'll go through it step by step because I've got, the, the, I've got the, the, the Wednesday assignment and I've got the, today's the, the residential assignment. So we'll go through the residential assignment today and we'll go through the um, commercial assignment on Wednesday. But I think you, you at least will understand the difference between the two types of org charts because they both ha have uh, requirements, right? Okay, so so for a project, I'm the GC. And as I've been trying, trying to emphasize too, you know what, like in most cases, the GC does not do a lot of the trade work themselves. Some do, you know, and again, that's why on if it's, if it's asking for your business org chart, well, maybe you decide, well, we do all the framing work ourselves. So we wouldn't need a framing subcontractor because we do that ourselves, right? So you just show um, that part of it in your business org chart. Uh, but in Toronto, if it's a bigger size project, very often the, the GC doesn't do that much themselves. They sub most of it out, uh, but you know, you can. You can, I'm not saying that you can't. Uh, I think I even mentioned um, in one of the videos, uh, like in the commercial side of things today, uh, big projects, uh, there's been some shuffling that's been going on. So I've, I think uh, I've mentioned that uh, very often, like 90% plus the work is done by others on a project. Well, you know what, some of these building systems contractors, some of these uh, building systems contractors, they've been doing a little bit of amalgamating, like the bigger ones, some of them, they've been buying up electrical contractors, and now then they can do plumbing and electrical, or some of them have been doing plumbing and they bought an HVAC sub and an electrical sub. So now they've got plumbing, HVAC and electrical that they do themselves. So then some of them are thinking, huh, well, we do plumbing, electrical, and HVAC, and that's a big part of the work. Why don't we be, do some general contracting? Because we already do a fair bit of the work. Like in, uh, in uh, bigger construction projects like commercial buildings and condo buildings and that, you know what? The building systems can be about 40% or more of the overall cost of building the project. So hmm, if, we, if we're doing about 40% of the work ourselves, why do we need somebody else to be the general contractor? We can bid this ourselves and we can be more competitive. So there's a little bit of rationalization that's going on. I wouldn't say that that's predominant, but there are these different, different nuances. And so how companies are organized and how org charts are organized impacts competitiveness as well. So it's, it's good to have a, an understanding of how they um, work and how they structure themselves that way and why they might do that that way. Why would a, um, why would a state electric wanna buy a 
huge HVAC and plumbing company because they want to amalgamate them and they feel they'll be more competitive. And you know what? Even if I'm subbing to a GC, if I'm them, that GC would like it because they've got one company they're dealing with that's going to do all those things. It's a little bit easier to coordinate the work, especially if you have a good relationship with them. So there's a lot of pluses to that. The downside is they've got a lot more risk because they got like all these employees that work with them and they got to keep them busy. And that is um, can be complicated in construction. So that's the downside. That's why, why that's one of the reasons why a lot of GCs, they prefer that they don't have so many direct employees doing the trades work. It's less risk involved and they don't have to worry if there's a downtime. Well, they don't they're not paying anybody for not working or they're not having to pay them, uh, you know, when they let them go, etc. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of those reasons behind what happens. Like 50 years ago, a lot more was self-performed by a general contractor than today. Let's put it that way. Any other questions on that? Sorry, guys, I don't know about that security deposit stuff, unfortunately. Um, you know who without will though. Um, uh, uh, Venice will know your sort of support person. Um, so if you want, I can put her email at the end of the class if you wanted to ask her a question. All right, so uh, I go through this pretty well, I think in the video. So the basically the notching and drilling aspect, uh, you really do have to think about um, the sub trades Essentially, so you should know all this stuff. I'm not going to go through this uh, in too much detail. You can watch the video for that. Uh, but you've got to, you as a contractor, you as a project manager, you as specifically a site super. This is a residential course. So I got to look at it different ways when I explain it to you. You could be working for a production builder. So a lot of our graduates, they'll go and they'll work with a, um, you know, a Madame Homes or a Tribute Communities, that sort of thing, where they build literally thousands of homes a year. And so if you work for one of those companies, they usually have a scope of work and a position sort of laid out for that job. Um, so like Madame Homes, they have a foundation builder and a foundation builder looks after all the foundations for the house, the cutting, the cutting, the filling, the, the in installation of the footings, the foundation walls, the drains, the damp proofing, the concrete slab in the basement, the concrete slab in the, in the, in the garage, the concrete slab in the porch, the sidewalks, the landscaping, and all of that. That's typically a foundation builder. But that's all they do. So they don't deal with the framing. They don't deal with um, all of the other aspects. So then they have another position, which is the builder. So they actually call it a junior, uh, sorry, a foundation builder deals with all of that. Then they have a um, junior builder or builder, they typically call it. And they look after the framing right up to the finishes. So they look at the framing right up through to the finishes. So there's a lot of things they got to look at. And then they have the senior builder and the senior builder is more like a project manager. So the foundation builder and the builder, they're more like site supers and the senior builder is more like the project manager because he's looking at uh, the customer, the client that purchased the house in um, some of the dealings, making sure that they're co corresponding with all their requirements, they're dealing with budgets, they're dealing with a lot of the administrative side that a project manager would typically deal with, who should get paid when, all of these things. So in that case, it's kind of to build a house is broken up into three people are, are kind of doing that. If you do it building a custom home, custom home, it could be one person and they're kind of acting like the site super project manager, you know, so um, it could be one person, they're kind of acting like the site super project manager for the, for the house. It could be that there's two people, there's a site super and there's a project manager, but then you probably have more than one house. That project manager is looking after a few custom homes because there wouldn't be enough just for them on one house. So it kind of, the roles mix up. It could be one person or it could be split up um, different ways. So you know, that would be one thing too, if you get a job with a, 
like a, a Mattamy Homes, and you ended up, uh, usually they'd start you out maybe at a builder position or a junior builder that assists a builder, um, assistant role, uh, then you would learn a lot about that one specific area. The other areas, not so much because you wouldn't get a chance to do that. Some of the pluses and minuses between working with a big, big company and a smaller company is that the bigger the company tends to be more the, the narrow your focus of what you do, right? So your scope of responsibility tends to be narrower because we have more specializations. And that's kind of the way the world of work uh, has evolved, right? We had uh, Taylorism and the whole idea of Taylorism was to break out and scientifically look at how can we do things more efficiently? Well, even in management roles, that comes into play as well. Um, so again, that's just different hierarchies and different ways that uh, companies will organize themselves. Um, but bigger will tend to mean there's more specialization. Smaller will tend to mean the sort of the chief cook and bottle washer aspect, right? Where you've got to be doing a little bit of everything. Or as uh, some people would uh, say that, um, you know, the more that you have or the more that you're trying to do, it's the less, less you can actually master too. So there's, there's, there's these different scenarios in how companies are organized. But for sure, Whoever the site person is needs to be watching the work of the trades and make sure that they are not damaging any of the structural elements during their aspect. So we, we've talked about, I think in our other class a little bit about put yourself in the other person's um, shoes. Uh, so look at things from uh, the other person's perspective, right? So if I look at it from, if I look at this from a subcontractor's perspective, the subcontractor, and it's a building system subcontractor, they want to run the, the ducts in the quickest, easiest way possible. So if you leave, if you leave an HVAC sub to their own devices, you're probably going to not have ducts that are running neatly beside the beam that later on you could put a bulkhead. They'll be running them on an angle because it's easier for them to run it on an angle, right? Yeah, they'll take a chainsaw to the joist. Um, so you have to make sure that you have a pre-award meeting with them before you give them, the, give them the contract and you sign off on the contract to make sure you're both on the same page Everything is in the scope of work that was required. <clears throat> There's no omissions, exclusions, because uh, they like to do that. <clears throat> An exclusion is they say, I, I do everything except um, the X, Y, Z, right? So they say that they don't do something. Well, you want to know what it is they don't do. So you know that the price that you're giving and getting for this contract makes sense. It's okay if they exclude something and you're saying it's still a good price and I can get this other subcontractor to do it. I just got to make sure it's in their contract. That's fine. But you want to know that. And then pre-construction, I always would have a meeting with the three building systems trades and I would discuss the duck runs and the plumbing runs in particular to try to make sure that there wasn't any conflicts ahead of time. Because plumb, certain plumbing pipes have to go in a certain place. If my toilet is in a certain spot, it has to go in that spot, right? So um, if I take a look at uh, if I take a look at this example here, I've got a powder room. There's a toilet. Well, you know what? The waste pipe for the toilet it has to be right in that spot. I can't have a duct running in that spot. But if I don't have these conversations and I don't go through it with the subcontractors and somehow the HVAC sub is in there first, then you know what? I'm going to find a duct in that spot and it's going to be in the way. And then that's going to have to be changed. And then that's rework. And then somebody's not happy and that's causing problems and issues. So you have to be very proactive in the coordination to make sure that everybody is understanding that. And you may have some problems just with the design, the structural design. Remember the direction of the joist? That maybe it's difficult for the HVAC sub to get a duct to a certain spot. And so very often that means you need a bulkhead. 
And a bulkhead is just a box that drops below the ceiling that the duct is hidden in. Well, preferably you would want to have any bulk, bulkheads or drops below the ceiling in the basement because usually, okay, people finish their basement, but it's not the same as the first floor. So usually if I'm going to have something happen like that, then I'm going to be planning for it in the basement, but still occasionally you might still need it on the first floor just because, just because. And so in cases like that, you want to discuss it so it's the least obtrusive, that it doesn't spoil the look of the room. In some cases, you can enhance the look of the room. I think the Brook Drawings has a coffered ceiling all the way around in the dining room, which can actually look very nice, but it's also a great opportunity to hide ducts and plumbing uh, uh, soil, uh, soil stacks, etc. cetera. So um, sometimes those things that look really nice are there to hide something else. And if you made it look nice, bonus for you because the client's going to be happy and you, you've enhanced the actual look of it. So some of these things can be challenges, but if they're not thought through, they become problems uh, later on. So you have to work like that part. I don't think I got through as well as I wanted to uh, in the actual uh, video recordings, that coordination aspect that you need to do. Now, as a general rule, uh, plumbing and ductwork is a lot more difficult to move than wiring. Um, so plumbing and ductwork is a lot more difficult to move around than wiring. So usually they get priority as to where they go, except with some things like uh, where the um, where the electrical uh, panel is um, going. You want to make sure that. Um, the electrical panel is not going to um, be right underneath some ducts. So you're gonna make sure that that conversation is carried out too. I've seen that where you have an electrical panel and just to give you an idea, just to give you an idea, well, maybe not. Yeah, there we go. You know, there's a lot of wires up there. I don't want to have a heating duct right above the panel with all the wiring, right? Because I'm going to have a lot of wiring come down at that point. So that's again, you know, some exceptions to the rule. If you got, if you know you're going to have uh, a lot of wiring running in a particular place, then that's not a good place for your duct. Doesn't mean that in other places where the ducts are, well, they might have to separate it with a piece of an insulation so that it, the wiring doesn't get too warm, etc. Uh, but you try to avoid those kind of conflicts where possible. So again, that's part of that um, coordination. All right. Yeah, I think we will. I think we will have the brook drawings on the final alley. Uh, so today I'm going to look at the Doncaster drawings, but for you guys, I'm mostly working with uh, the brook drawings. Um, I, I'm going to be using the Doncaster today just to give you some examples of things because in the book, it's got the actual... Um, HVAC uh, drawings for that. <clears throat> okay, so that making sense so far? You guys okay so far with that? So the plumbing system, the plumbing system you got really two systems that are tied together. You got the drain waste vent system and you got the supply system. The supply system brings the water in and the drain waste vent system takes it out, right? You take a shower, you've got water coming in and it's going down the drain, right? So you've got the two systems. A uh, big thing in plumbing, why it's a compulsory, mandatory, regulated trade is there's a lot of things that can go wrong. You know, uh, the potable water could be contaminated if it's wrongly installed. Uh, the drain waste vent system, if you don't have things properly vented, it could leak in sewer gas, a methane gas, decomposing uh, gas that comes up from the sewers. And then that can be uh, very, very uh, unhealthy for inhabitants. Um, so. Uh, we have these systems in place, in particular traps. So you should be thinking that all the fixtures will have some sort of trap, either an external trap like a basin or a built-in trap like a toilet. So our um, 
Our toilet, that's why you see water in the bottom, has a built-in trap. And if the water evaporates out of the trap, then sewer gas can come in, right? Right now I'm up at uh, Collingwood and when I'm in, uh, when I, it was funny because when I uh, purchased this place about three years ago, uh, one of the things was, <laughs> so you go in, we came in the, the place and it smelled like sewer gas, right? And I was like, huh, this smells off. Maybe it was kind of good because maybe it scared a lot of people, uh, but uh, smelled like sewer gas. And so the person that, that had this place, they didn't live here all the time. They came up occasionally. And uh, so if you don't come up for like six or seven weeks, the water dries out of the traps, right? My wife was like, right away, this house, no way, no way, no way. And I said, no, wait a minute, maybe it's just the... the, 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 the. So I, I did a quick look and I checked it. And of course it was uh, the sewer gas, but I also went farther. I had uh, plumbing, uh, one of the uh, plumbing uh, professors from George Brown take a look at it and everything just to make sure. One of the issues with this particular place is it's right by the lake and there's very high winds that come off the lake. And the high winds actually uh, blow over the pipe where it exits the house because this vent pipe has to exit the house through the roof, all right? So where it exits through the roof, the wind crossing over it disrupts the water in the trap and that makes it evaporate quicker. So that was a little bit of a problem too because I don't necessarily come up here all the time either. Um, so what I found was that if you put like a, a trap, like it's not a trap, but an up, up uh, an inverted loop on the roof, then that cut down um, the wind pressure on the traps. So that's why the traps are there. The traps are there to stop sewer gas from coming into the house. And some of you, maybe you've got a parent or somebody that owns a house and occasionally it's an older house in the basement. Occasionally you smell a little bit of sewer gas. If that's the case, it's probably the drain in the floor has dried out, right? Because basement's not leaking. So it's dried out. Pour a little bit of water in it about every month and you won't have that problem because it's got a trap in the floor. Just like, uh, I think there was a picture. Maybe it's further up here. No, there's a picture here somewhere. Just like this. So you've got a trap in your floor drain. Now we also have a trap seal primer in newer houses. By newer, I mean, they've had this for about 30 years that they always put it in. Uh, but anything older than that, like in Toronto, which is a lot, um, won't have that trap seal primer. Every time you turn on the laundry tub faucet, some water goes into this trap. The other thing is if you have a high efficiency furnace, there's usually a condensate um, line and a little bit of water will flow into the trap. But there's still times of year where you might not have enough of that going on um, to um, resolve those issues. So keeping that up helps that way. All right. Um, and most of our, uh, our water supply systems now use PEX, which is a form of plastic. Um, uh, you can get it, I can probably not pronounce it properly, but basically it's a, it's a compound that's used for the piping system. Uh, older homes always use copper, but copper's kind of gotten pretty expensive. So they're using this um, PEX uh, uh, tubing, which is very easy and quick to install. Uh, hopefully in 10 years, they won't say there's some sort of water problem with it dissolving into the, the water. I don't know, but that's what they're using right now. Uh, okay, so that's kind of the plumbing aspect that I went over. Uh, now, I just wanted to go through the HVAC a little bit. I kind of go through this in the video, so I'm not going to spend too much, but just so you know, this is the Doncaster house. So this is the ductwork in the Doncaster house. And then in your book, this is the HVAC shop drawings for how the HVAC sub is going to install the heating, ventilation, air conditioning system. So it's got where the furnace is going to be installed. And it's got basically uh, the duck runs and the return runs. All right, so returns 
are where the air comes back into the furnace and the supplies are where it comes out of the furnace or air conditioner. So if we're looking at this, there's your furnace here. It hasn't got the cover on the, on the face of it. There's a blower and the blower sucks air out of the bottom and blows it out of the top. And then of course, um, you've got your, your um, heating component that if it's gas, it's a gas heating component that is going to um, heat that air, warm it and blow it up through the top and warm air rises. So that makes it a lot easier because it's basically using physics to its advantage to push the warm air where it needs to go. And while it's pushing, it's also sucking cooler air from the rooms to displace and come back in to be reheated. So in our house, we have cold air returns or return air ducts, probably a better way to say it and supply ducts. Supply ducts will typically be located underneath windows, doors, sliding doors, where they lose the most, where the building loses the most heat. And our buildings are the least uh, efficient at doors and windows. So like an, the R value of a wall, right? The R value of a wall might have a resistance to heat loss of say R25, uh, and a window might have a resistance to heat loss of a really efficient window might have a resistance to heat loss of like R4. Um, so big difference. So you usually lose a lot more heat out of your windows and doors than you do your walls. So to compensate for that, they will uh, have the supplies come out below the window. And so that doesn't, it doesn't feel so cold around the, the window area. Now, of course, if it's on the south side, then it's gonna feel not bad when the sun is out, but uh, that's how uh, the distribution works in a forced air system. And I mentioned in the video, you know, why this is the most common one. So you can watch that to see why uh, that is. Um, but we also use our air conditioning systems too to use the same ductwork. That's a, a big advantage there. Now, if I go to uh, my floor plans, so I just wanted you to realize that the floor plan in the book, which is this, is matching this. So the HVAC subcontractor does up this floor plan based on the floor plan for the house. And so they have one for each, for each floor, right? So they have one for each floor that they've done, which is showing where their um, ducts are gonna go. Now here you see it's coming between the two windows. Well, they didn't wanna run one for each window, so it's between the, each window. Here you see it's by the windows. Um, here you got a bathtub here, so you don't have much choice with an outside wall. You got a vanity and um, you, this is where the fan is. Now the HVAC sub will also show all of the locations of the fans because they have to, they have to build into their calculations, how much air gets sucked out of the building potentially when fans are turned on, et cetera. So that's part and parcel of the airflow in the building structure. Uh, they have typically have a design software that they will use. Nobody does it by hand anymore. There's a design software and it, they punch in the orientation of the house. You know, is it facing north, south, which wall? What's the window surface area on those walls? What's the R value of the walls, et cetera? And so that really looks at then um, the heat loss of the overall structure. And then they design a furnace system that will meet that capacity. So they have to be kind of careful, like if you, over design the furnace, meaning it's way bigger than necessary, it tends to not run that efficiently, right? So if you over design it, it tends not to run that efficiently. And the government is not happy with that because we wanna have very efficiently run homes. On the other hand, if you under design the furnace, uh, that means in the coldest days, it might not be able to keep up and it might not be able to keep the house warm enough. So that's why they have to, that's why it's a mandatory regulated trade. That's why they have to get um, uh, a permit that requires heat loss calculations, 
requires a, a, a designer stamp on it and it's reviewed by the city. So they designed the size of the ducts based on the blower size in the furnace, the duct runs, and part of it too is how many bends you have in the duct work. Uh, when I was uh, talking with uh, the um, sheet metal professor at George Brown, he was explaining to me when I was doing up the book and I was asking a lot of detailed questions on this. He said, you have to think of a, a duct run um, that if it's straight, it flows better. If it's round, it flows better. It's about friction. And if you have a lot of elbows, it restricts the flow. So the more elbows you have in a duct run, the bigger the duct needs to be in order to be able to get that air um, where it needs to go. Uh, so you try to design it that you minimize the amount of elbows. Like I've seen where you have, you know, a duct run and then it comes down below the joist then it goes along and then it comes back up. So you got like one, two, three elbows in, you know, like a little space like this. Well, that's, that's putting a lot of resistance in that pipe, that duct. And so um, he said that you, you could pretty much think of one elbow being like 10 feet of straight run you're adding to the duct, right? So one elbow is like adding 10 feet of straight run by friction, the amount of friction it causes to the airflow. So you try to design it that you have as few of those, but you gotta work, unfortunately, you gotta also work around all of the joists, the beams, and you gotta figure out what's the best way to run this and minimize the elbows. And if you can have a large trunk run that you feed off of so you can get it with large capacity to another end of the house, then that's gonna be very helpful uh, in minimizing the re resistance that goes on. So, and then also with that, you wanna to try to minimize, you know, that you don't have ducts in the middle of the ceiling. Like here, you've got it beside the steel beam. So if this room is being finished at some later point, you could drop a, a bulkhead down below and across to the other side here and make it one kind of uh, drop instead of having a whole bunch of different drops and then having a whole pile of bulkheads that the ceiling is just a mess, you can try to minimize uh, what it'll look like later when you finish it. So you've got this challenge because a lot of HVAC subs, they don't think about that because that's not their business, unfortunately. Uh, they kind of know it, but if they can see, well, it's easier for me to run it this way and this, this, uh, this guy's not telling me anything different, I'm just going to run it the easy way. Uh, so you got to have those discussions in mind, trying to ensure that you have the best layouts that number one, it's going to get the heat to where it needs to go or the air conditioning, the cool air to where it needs to go. And number two, you can finish it later in new housing, production housing. A lot of times they don't give you a finished basement. So even the builder doesn't really care because they're long gone. And now three, four years later, you want to finish the basement. Now you got all these ducts everywhere that it's difficult to build around. Um, so uh, that becomes um, uh, the problem, right? So you've got, you need to work that out. This, this particular one, you can kind of see it here. Uh, it goes into the bottom of the furnace. If it goes into the bottom of the furnace, this is the cold air return. Cold air returns just get filled in between the joists. They don't necessarily get sealed tight the way the supply air ducts do. They get taped up and they get sealed up that you want to try to make sure that that supply air gets exactly where it's going. You can kind of see where this duct run kind of crosses back over through here. And it should be based on there. There's where you see it coming back across. See that coming back across there? Um, that is that duct run coming there and coming back across. So that's this is the actual Doncaster. And this is the drawing of how they've laid it out. And then there would be feeder lines coming off of that. So your supply lines would um, come off of that. And then when it says six inch or it says four, uh, if it says six inch or um, if it doesn't say six inch, it's five inch, right? If it doesn't give you a size, then it's five inch. Unless it's course, it's um, like a, a main duct run, then it'll be whatever it's designed to be like 14 by eight in this case. Um, so the, 
returns, and then if you see return R or return high wall or return low wall, that's a return duct. So a return duct looks like this. It's just cut open, drywalls on both sides, there's openings in the floor and that offers the air to go uh, be sucked back to the furnace. So this would be sucked through here. It would fill in over here because this is actually right above that and the floor above, and then it'll go back into the furnace. You're really limited by whatever value it has by the openings in this wall, right? So uh, that would be that. On the second floor, uh, you see where it says return high wall. So I didn't get into this in the video, but the high wall, they have the return at the top. Now it makes a lot of sense uh, in, and in this case, they had one on the top and one on the bottom is what they did. Um, in the summer, you have a lot of problem. Does anybody have a problem with it being uh, in your, um, if you live in a house with the second floor when it's really hot out, being warm, even though you got air conditioning, even though you got air conditioning. Well, you're, you're trying to work against physics. You're trying to push cool air to the second floor. It's harder to push the cool air in this to the second floor than it is. The warm air wants to rise. The cool air wants to um, stay low. So ha by having uh, the high wall, the return on the high wall, well, it makes it easier if it's sucking to suck the warm air, the warm air is going to be up at the ceiling, so it's going to be easier to suck that, right? So you're, it's right there. So it'll try to suck that down while you're pushing up the cool air, but it's still more difficult. It's still more difficult. Usually you end up having to have the first floor a lot cooler so that you can sleep at night with the second floor reasonably cool. Yeah, it's still, and then that depends on uh, Arcelin, it depends on the design. Because the other thing is, is the blower capacity enough? Is the duct capacity enough? Is the furnace located in an ideal spot? Um, ideally, you want the furnace to be kind of centrally located to the house. Like I would not want to have the furnace here and I would not want to have the furnace here, right? Because if I've got to push this all the way over to that corner, it's going to be very difficult. It's more difficult. It's not impossible, but it's more difficult, right? So you try to put it more centrally located, but then you also have to deal with the beams and the structure and the runs of the ducts, et cetera. So you also have to look at the location of the walls, et cetera, that are above this. Um, so um, that's part and parcel of that. Also the ducts where they come out, See how it's got a slit there and a slit there? Well, that's where it comes out on the floor above, right? So that means 16 and 14, they come out in the floor above. So that's gonna be on the first floor where you'll see the supply grills, right? Um, so that's where they're coming out. Where you see a slit again, well, that's where these are gonna come out. This one here on an angle, this one here, this one here, they're gonna come out on the second floor. See, there's the one on the angle. There's those ones, right? So that's how um, the supply lines are working with um, that. And as I said, they usually try to put them on a, at a window, but again, there's some cases, you know, you got, this is the shower, this is the fan above the toilet. I got no real place I wanna put it there. And it's not gonna look too good right in front of the tub. So they end up putting it there, okay? So, just giving you a good sense of it. And then this is a sort of a BIM cross section of um, the ductwork uh, in the actual. So this is again, the Doncaster house. You can see it's working its, its way ar around the steel beam, right? And then the joist changed direction at this point, and then it's coming up inside the wall. So this is kind of showing how um, it got because it's showing a cut through of the powder room here. Um, so that's where we are. So we're close. It means the cut through that it's showing is pretty much um, through here. Through here. So you could see the powder room and how it's getting the supply to the second floor, which is there. So that's what that is showing here, getting that supply to um, the second floor. So it's just showing at that cut through what you actually see. There's a lot more going on, 
Um, this is just a cut through of a BIM uh, drawing. This was done by uh, one of the architectural students that I had at one point and uh, um, he was really good on this uh, stuff. Uh, so really um, uh, that's, we'll talk about actually BIM a little bit on Wednesday and I know Nakshab that's, you ever want to talk to anybody about BIM, Nakshab's uh, a good uh, source. You'll also have um, Petrol, who's in your program teaching too, to source a lot of details on the, the BIM drawing aspects. So that's kind of the, that part. Uh, any questions on the plumbing and HVAC before I quickly um, go on the electrical? Would an architect consider HVAC or would they see the placement of ducts as somebody else's problem? Well, a better answer to that, I think, um, Sean, would be uh, how, how proactive do they think? And uh, what is their, do they think more proactively or reactively? Because sooner or later, somebody else's problem becomes their problem when there is no other way to run a duct and they don't want to have any bulkheads, right? So that can become somebody else's problem. The biggest problem is though, very often once they have, in the early parts of the design, they don't consult with an HVAC sub typically. Uh, so that's where if you're actually, you know, you're doing a custom home, if, if you have a contractor, like if a, our, I used to with a lot of architects, if I was a preferred contractor, they would ask me for my opinion on things. And then I'd get for sure a chance to bid on the project. And uh, sometimes if they think it's something complex, they can, they can consult with a um, uh, HVAC engineering consultant. So then they will consult with them. Like I guarantee you 100% in a condominium building, there is that con consultation that's going in. They have to be consulting with the structural engineers, with the mechanical engineers, the electrical engineers, and coordinating to make sure that this is going to actually work. So in those cases, they have to be proactive. In custom homes, they, you know, if it's been an architect that's been in business a long time, they picked up a lot of things uh, with, through their dealings with HVAC subcontractors. And then they may consult with them if it's something that they see is a little bit tricky that they think that there could be some issues with. If it's just a, a fairly typical design that's kind of in their wheelhouse, um, they're probably okay with it. Uh, but if they don't, or they're not really experienced in that, then you got problems because uh, then they're going to be in reactive mode. And then it's going to be like, well, we've already framed this and now we got to do this. And now you got to do rework. And that's really not lean thinking. Uh, I'm going to bring up lean in Wednesday in the other class, but the idea is to have more collaboration early on to reduce rework and frustration uh, later on. So I guess that would be uh, my uh, answer um, for that. Okay, yeah. Um, so uh, watch the videos because a lot of stuff I'm not explaining on this, right? So I'm just trying to fill in any gaps that maybe I didn't uh, get in the videos or clarify things as well. Uh, and I'll post uh, this one too because uh, of my explanation of the org chart stuff at the beginning might be helpful if anybody needs to go back and what did he say on this? What did he say on that? Uh, okay, so the electrical side of things, you know, Electrical is very complex as well, and it's a it's a mandatory regulated trade. Uh, so uh, we have to again do that. And there's basic there's you know um, a certificate of qualification for electricians. There's a master's electrician license to run an electrical business, uh, and for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is people get electrocuted and it causes fires. Uh, so and I included a, a pretty good section I think on. Um, sort of the history of uh, how electrical wiring has changed over time. Many of you too get into renovations and other things uh, and uh, you run into a lot of different conditions. So you should know uh, what and why in sort of the time period. So I get into that in the um, video, especially the, the knob and tube and even the two wiring uh, the way that it was. Uh, also, uh, arc uh, fault protection. So, sorry, all art fault, uh, uh, art fault circuit interrupters, uh, more new than ground fault circuit interrupters. And these protect buildings from 
little arcs that might happen in wires that might spark and cause a fire. Uh, so it helps to protect buildings and the, the electrical code, that's the one thing I wanna establish. The electrical code, the plumbing code, um, the uh, mechanical HVAC uh, code requirements, they're changing as I speak. So you always have to consult with an expert in these areas and any changes they should be apprised of Sometimes they get caught because the changes happen very quickly. Uh, but ground, ground fault circuit interrupters protect people, measuring the flow out and the flow in. Milliamps, the difference, and it should cut off, uh, whereas this uh, will cut off if there's a spark. And I get into that in, in the video. So um, I get into that in a lot more uh, detail that way. Uh, so our wiring uh, becomes uh, an issue and uh, it's easier though from a coordination issue. I think what we run into some problems too sometimes is with uh, pot light layouts and trying to get them exactly even on a ceiling, which doesn't necessarily work out depending on joist spacing because where the joists are. There's a lot more flexibility with different types of pot lights now. Uh, they're LEDs typically, very low uh, energy consumption. They let off a lot less heat than the older pot lights um, used to. Um, so uh, there's a lot of really fantastic kind of lighting systems that, are, that have been coming on the market really in the last uh, three years, I would say. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, changes that way, which is also requiring less energy consumption, which is great. And the price has dramatically dropped uh, with LED. So that's, that's providing a lot of creative um, opportunities with lighting. Uh, the other thing that I, I get into too is the aspect of... Um, and I get into this in the green sort of systems area because I talk about uh, green building and green systems uh, a little bit is also uh, thinking about uh, vehicles, charging for vehicles and their requirements. Uh, so um, I had to educate myself a little bit on this more recently. And because um, uh, it's, it's not yet mandatory in the building code, but I will be surprised if it's not very soon mandatory in the building code that you would in a new house have to put a plug-in uh, um, outlet for a charging a future charging station that you want to um, put for your vehicle. And so uh, the little bit of background that I did, I went to the Ministry of Transportation website, kind of gives you a sort of an overview of the difference between electric vehicles and gasoline vehicles and what you might spend on the difference in gas, uh, current uh, difference in pricing, you know, up to eight times more money um, spent on gas than electric electricity based on <clears throat> the type of vehicle that you're using. So that's a pretty good incentive there, although electric vehicles still tend to be a little bit more expensive, prices are dropping and changes coming about. Uh, so I think you're going to see a lot of uh, changes that way. And uh, you're building new houses, that's how building codes change, right? So circumstances change. Well, you want to make you don't want to make it that you undersized a panel or somebody has to run a wire and open up their basement ceiling and stuff in a brand new house or two or three year old house when there should have been an outlet there. If you wanna have a gas vehicle still fine, but there's an outlet there if in future. And usually these things are very inexpensive overall to do when you're building a new house. So um, when you're doing it later after the fact, it's a lot, you know, it's maybe three or four times as expensive as when you're doing it brand new. Uh, so that, that comes into it. So there's usually different charging levels uh, you can plug into a regular outlet, but I think that's kind of nonsense if you're going to only get uh, about one out. What does it say? It's a, it was crazy, the amount. Um, level one, 15 amp, that's a regular outlet, uh, adds about eight kilometers of range per hour. Okay, that's as good if you're visiting your, your mother-in-law and you're desperate and you need a charge, um, but you're not going to do that if you live at, if it's your house. So level two charging, uh, is in public uh, places a 240 volt. So, so 240 volt, I explained in the video, is what you'd need for your stove. It's what you'd need for your dryer, um, those types of things. And then it's either 30 amps if it's like for a dryer or 40 amps if it's for a stove. And so this is saying similar to a dry, dryer. And then you would get 30 to 50 kilometers of range per hour, which probably means that, you know, you come home at eight o'clock at night, you leave at six o'clock in the morning, 
uh, you're going to get about 500 kilometers of charge. So I think of Tesla's around that uh, in a full charge. So that would probably do you. Of course, charging stations are, are taking a higher voltage system. Uh, whether that would be standard in a house, probably not. But for charging centers, that probably would because you need a quick charge and it's much faster to do that. And there, the technology as I speak is changing. So, um, uh, but these are becoming um, standardized. The good thing is my understanding when I checked is that the plugs, uh, like the, the, the hookups then for your station that you plug into this, it's pretty standard. So it's not a big deal that um, between vehicles or that sort of thing, you just have to get the right plug uh, between, but it's not a big deal. So that was kind of on that. And I kind of go through the other areas of green building. So I think that's um, pretty much uh, the uh, areas. So make sure that you go through the videos because I do spend some time going through this and that should clarify it. I'm not giving this short shrift. I just wanted to make sure people were clear on those um, parts. And there's plenty of explanation in those other parts. And anything that you find really you want to dive deep on you can you can do a little bit of extra on your own like if there's something that, that really is like I didn't know that and you wanted to find more about it I encourage you to to do that okay so why don't we take a short break and that'll give you a little bit of time I'm just going to go stop share and then I'm going to go screen share again and we have your residential construction technology assignment. Uh, so give you a few minutes. Uh, people have been emailing me. So my preference is that, you know, take a few minutes. If there's uh, uh, some questions I can help you with or answer here or clarify for this, that will be very helpful. This one's not due for uh, what, the 23rd. So this one, you got a little bit of time on. We've got um, two weeks on. So again, I'll, I'll leave some time next week too, if you have some questions. Uh, but I am trying to minimize maybe the emails. Um, so that way I don't have, I, you can still email me, but first make sure you've looked at the video on the assignment. And then also, you know, take notes for what questions you get. At, I answer here and I will post this video lecture too. Um, so that, because uh, I this semester I have like 400 students all together and when I get everybody just every two seconds flying off with an email, uh, it's hard for me to keep up. Uh, so that's all I'm saying uh, that way. So I'm going to try to help you answer any questions uh, here and next week on this one um, that way. And uh, so I'll, let, why don't we take a 10 minute break and then uh, I can answer any questions after that and gives you some time to, to think about that. Okay. So we'll come back, uh, say at uh, around uh, 10, 18. Sounds good. Okay, great. See you in a few, few minutes.
Okay, uh, we're back. So, um, what are some of the questions people are having regarding the assignment? And I'll maybe clarify some things. So what should we do if we do not see any changes in our houses? Yes, I will upload it for you, Shaquille. It might take me till tomorrow, but I will upload it. And if for some reason I don't, you're gonna remind me on Wednesday, right? Okay, perfect. Um, what should we do if we do not see any changes in our houses? Well, you know what, if you've taken pictures for five weeks and it, you're, you got custom homes, right? Um, uh, so if there's four houses and nothing's happened to any of the four, then I would look at what stage is that house at? Um, is it the foundation? Is it the framing? Is it the brickwork? Is it the windows? Like whereabouts are they in the work? And just say, well, obviously they must have had uh, one or other of these problems. So let's say they're at the foundation and they didn't start the framing. There's obviously a problem with them getting the framing crews here in the, the time frame. I'm not aware, we're not aware of whether this was because the project, uh, the foundation is ahead of schedule, or if there's some financial issue, or if the project wasn't properly organized. But then you at least explain why you think this house was not, nothing was done over the five week period. So that's all you have to do there. Um, number two, prepare a detailed description of the residential project using the brook drawings uh, signed in class. So you're just going to describe the project. I would look at, you know, in the brook drawings, it, it, you can see how many square feet it is. You can see a bunch of detailed information about that particular project. You should be able to describe it. If you're not really sure, you know what? Um, who's asking that question? Um, Gabe. If you're not really sure, Gabe, too, you know what? Uh, you could, you could um, uh, Google realestate.com. Uh, you could download the app on your uh, phone. So as an example, realtor.ca, realtor.ca. So I'm just trying to pull that up. Uh, and you know what? So you've got, you've got like a house, right? So you just uh, click on a house and you say, all right, so there's this house, right? And it describes the house. What do they say? General description. What kind of stuff do they say about this house, right? So you could look at that. Okay, so what could I say about the Brook House that's similar that describes the house? You could, you know, go through, then it goes to property info. Well, pretty much on your drawings, you can see uh, maybe not the, the land size, but because I didn't give you a site plan, but you can see it's got an attached garage. You can see uh, a lot of the typical information there, and that will give you an idea of how to write up the description for it. So you can look at it. Well, how do they describe a house when they're trying to sell it? Does that make sense? For number two? Yeah, it does. Thanks, sir. Okay, great. Uh, can you go over the construction plan for the intro to construction, Matt? I'm going to do that on Wednesday, Jordan. So I'll go over that one on Wednesday. So I'm going to do this on Wednesday as well for, for that particular class. So I'll go over the, con uh, you're talking about the, for the Wednesday class, right? Um, intro to construction. Yeah, you are. You're specific there. Yeah, I'll definitely do that for that. But some of the stuff I'm talking about here, you can extrapolate to there for the, for the most part. I'm, I'm pretty flexible because I know there's going to be differences. I know there's going to be houses in this one and buildings in that one that you don't see much done, but then you can try to rationalize the reasons um, for it. Okay. Um, yes, I will definitely post the uh, lecture seven slides. Post lecture seven slides. As long as you guys keep reminding me, I will um, post the, the lecture slides. So whenever I do a video, I'll post the slides. But for some reason, I miss it. Just remind me, um, um, and then I'll try to do it. 
Okay, because I'm trying to post everything that I can. Sometimes it's a little bit slower to do. My biggest problem with these kind of videos is it takes forever to rent what they call render them. But um, yeah, no problem. Are we supposed to make up our, yes, you are supposed to make up your own general contracting firm, which means you got a lot of flexibility, right? But if you're not sure, you know what? You can go online, you can get different ideas. That's what I want you to do is think about the different things uh, and the different ways and uh, that companies organize themselves. And as some of your emails have been asking, what's an org chart? Right, so we're trying to get the clarify. It doesn't matter what business you're in, the business, if it has any employees, has an org chart. And that's just how, and if they don't have an official org chart, they have a way that things, people have responsibilities and then people report to somebody. Well, you put that into boxes, that's an org chart. There's an org chart for a business and then there can be an org chart for how this project is being managed. A lot of times the project org chart kind of associates itself with the contract type, like we talked about in Wednesday's class. Uh, but design bid build, that would be the most common type of org chart that way for a project. Uh, Okay, so clarify number two, prepare a detailed description. Oh, uh, yeah, so it is for the Brook drawings. So it says, prepare a detailed description of the residential project using the Brook drawings. But the previous question asked me, how do I do that? Like, what do I say, right? And so then I'm saying, real, review some real estate listing for new custom homes or even a resale and you'll get a good idea. Or the other thing you could also go to is like Madame Homes website and see some of the residential plans that they have or a tribute site and how do they describe it if they have it. Um, what I don't wanna hear is there's nothing on the internet about houses. <laughs> Can you help me find houses on the internet? That's not a good question. If I don't answer you, you'll know why. Um, that kind of stuff. I'm just trying to, cause I, I get some of these emails too and it's sort of like, well, where do I start, right? Um, so. And it's not that I'm trying to be mean, but if you're me and it's like uh, Saturday night and you're getting all these emails, it's kind of like, okay. Um, which one are you looking? Well, you know, you read this, right? Prepare the description of uh, your general contracting firm business structure, right? So I read that, prepare a description of your general contracting firm comma business structure, one, right? And the organizational chart based on a custom home building company building the project. So in this case, I would look at providing two, all right? I would look at providing two, one for the project and one for the business. Now, in this particular case, you know, like, where are we? Project uh, project description. I would also kind of look at where the marks are coming from on various things and try to see, you know, um, what's going to require a bit more effort and what's probably going to require a little bit less effort too. So you're trying to figure out, you know, where, where are the marks? Question four, how do we identify the timeline for each trade and how long each trade should take to be in the house? You know what, you can more or less guesstimate that. You can take a look at, in the book, I have sort of an outline of a sample one that I talk about the chapters, that'll give you a good idea for that. Um, so I'm not gonna be cr highly critical to say to you, Vittorio, you allowed three weeks for framing, you should have only allowed one week. That's not gonna happen, right? Because this is not that course. I just want you to get a good sense of how schedules are and how they work. I'm not, I have a high expectation. This is a very broad course, this course. So I just want you to have some understanding of the importance of schedules. And if you've thought through the logistics of this, later when you take the planning and scheduling course, you've already got like a reasonable foundation to start with and then grow into. Typically a custom home, if you want a guideline, a custom home usually takes about one, 10 months to a year to build. A production home usually is gonna be four to six months. So if you wanna 
in your head, that's the overall and break it down. You can do it that way. Hi, sir. I had a question. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like regarding three and four. Um, it kind of looks like three and four are very similar. However, three is asking for just like to list a subcontractor. Yeah. Each. You know what? I don't have really a problem there. I put five months for 20 weeks, you know, just to give you an idea on this one. The truth is, so I've got, I think I got two different tables. When, when you do one, it's pretty easy to get the other. The difference between one and the other, this one has dates, right? So this one has dates, right? So prepare a construction sequence. So you really must list a minimum 40 tasks in sequence in which the buildings be started. Identify a subcontractor for each one. The key difference here is this one has dates. And what that really means, uh, Khalid, uh, in project management, we call we have what we call planning, we have what we call scheduling, and we have what we call control. So planning would be number three, scheduling would be number four. So you're now gonna put dates to things. And that's the difference. So a lot of your work, you're quite right, is done in number three. The only difference is number four then adds dates. Does that make sense? Wonderful, thank you so much, sir. And just, maybe I'll just, I'm just gonna change the screen just for a sec. I'm gonna put back, I pulled up one because I thought I might have a, a question like that. So Khalid uh, kind of uh, asked the question I thought. So where this is kind of like the reason this is in this course is to help to lead you to future courses. Cause this area is one of the most in the project management side, one of the most important parts of construction. You got estimating is very important. The other is project management, planning, scheduling, and control of construction project. So planning is kind of like, um, if I fix this so that I, I explain it kind of what uh, Khalid was asking, if I put resource, uh, um, so I'll just put, uh, where is it? Resources, resource type. Nope, that's not the one I'm looking for. Uh, delete. Oh, okay, just click here. Um, delete and insert the column. No, it's not coming up, okay. Try that again. There we go. All right, that's what I wanted to do. Okay, so we've got, the first one is just assuming that you have the activities laid out and the resources applied. The next one is really looking at the durations and the start and finish. So the start and finish in particular. And that is leading to you understanding completely how you plan this project. Who is doing what, what it's gonna cost eventually and how long it's gonna take. And also, is there things we can do at the same time? Right, is there things we can do at the same time? So um, this is where that's leading, but not in this course, you know, all of this. So in a very sort of summary way, it's giving you this stuff, but not getting so detailed into like a cost loaded schedule where we got costs, we can monitor the costs in the project, we can update the project, we can see um, variances as work progresses, et cetera, we can track the work. So we, we're starting off just giving you a sense of that aspect of it in this particular course. Uh, so I'll go back now. And stop share. And then I'll share that again. Uh, okay, more questions. So I'm falling behind. Okay, perfect. Then for number three, can we just point form then the schedule for uh, four is with timelines. Yeah, you, I think I have a template with it. Uh, so um, for the number four, there's like an Excel 
uh, template that you can just fill out. You could even use the first several columns on a different sort of slide or um, uh, print uh, insertion into the assignment that shows number three. It's not gonna, it's not gonna mean a, a ton more work for you to go from one to the other. Absolutely not. They could be similar, I don't know. They, if they're done right, uh, and then you'd be surprised what I'm gonna see. <laughs> I'm gonna see roofs going on before the foundation is dug. <laughs> if any, if, if previous years are any example. So if it's all done right, it should be similar, but there's certain things you can always do differently. Um, there's certain things that have to happen a certain way, right? And then there's some things I could do it this way and I could do it that way. So we talk about in project management, planning and scheduling, physical, uh, technical and resource constraints. All of those combine to decide how we're gonna construct the, the project. If it's a house, it's a house, whatever it is. No, I don't think I, um, I don't think I asked for pricing anywhere in there. No prices. Nope. Hi, sir. Hi. Right, yeah, I have a couple of questions actually. Uh, yeah, for, we'll number, for number one, when we are asked to, like how I understood the assignment was that we were we are tasked to build like four houses in the time frame of five months. Is that correct? No, you got the Brooks house. Oh, I think so. we had to be like, like. You're going to take pictures of four other houses. I just want you to see things that are happening outside. Oh, I see. I see. So, so this is the one that you're dealing with for most of the work, right? Oh, this is the one that you're scheduling for this. Okay. Because I thought that we were, we were tasked to prepare yeah. a company where we had to put like how many people work for us, our equipment and stuff. Well, you can detail that in the description more or less of the org chart and describe your company. That's not a big deal. You know, okay. I don't want to know. Um, I've got Charlie works for me. He's got two hammers and a saw and he's got, <laughs> I don't need to know that. Oh, uh, but how about like uh, excavators? Like if we have three excavators or two of these stuff. You don't have to get into that level of detail. You could say okay. that if for some reason your company started as an excavation company and you're now building custom homes, you could say that, but you don't need to um, get into that detail. No. Uh, so it's more about the history of the company. Yeah, like I just said, what I just said, you know, you can oh, do okay. that. All right, and then when we are asked to prepare a detailed description, should we go like, okay, so we have this site now, we have to cut down three trees, then excavate to a depth of the brook drawings depth, right? This is more or less the building characteristic based on the drawings, right? So like, so, I, like I said with the, the, you know, if you don't know how to word that and don't have any idea, go to uh, realtor.ca or go to a home building uh, website that they're trying to sell homes. What are they saying and how are they describing the house? And then what the, how do, would I describe this particular house? Cause they could be describing a two bedroom and this is a four bedroom, right? Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's not that complicated that way. All right. You don't want to do four separate houses and four separate schedules and four, you know, no. Just that this is more just finding four houses and taking, you know, the what's happened to them and describe what's going on. And now it's seeing something physically in front of you was uh, the idea for that without putting anybody in jeopardy that they have to actually go on a project and that sort of thing. I see. Thank you, sir. Okay. Do I have that um, template uh, for the um, construction plan? I thought I put that on the Blackboard. So let's go to Blackboard. Uh, Blackboard and um, log in. 57, okay, and Blackboard, no, uh, major assignment. Let's 
stop share and share again, Blackboard. So in Blackboard, to answer uh, the question, you go where it says major assignment, construction plan template. And then there's also major assignment instruction. And then there's also the brook drawings. And then this is where you actually upload the assignment to when you're done, okay? And you know what, if there's the templates just to help guide you, it's just like, oh, but I got this really good information that ties to this and he doesn't have a spot for it. Put it in, that's fine. Just put a heading on it, put it in. But try to put it in the spot that it's most related to. Or if you want, put an appendix and say more information in the appendix. Whatever way you want to then give it to me that makes sense. All right, don't feel, oh, but I had this great thing and it doesn't have a spot for me. Put it in. If it helps you to um, sell the work that you've done on this project, then that's a good thing. Okay? So again, I'm being pretty flexible, but I'm just trying to give you a guideline with the construction plan template, but I'm not trying to put handcuffs on you, right? Hey, Tom, I think what uh, Noah was asking there is for the actual, like for our group, we just made our own Excel template, but I think he was asking the one that's in the assignment plan that you've like that template, it's just a picture of the Excel spreadsheet. I think he's asking, is oh, there really? an actual Excel file? Oh, okay. Maybe I didn't load the run. This is the overall template. Um, maybe you're right. Uh, okay. And oh no, I got this stuff going on. Okay, so I'm in here. Uh, so I saw that. That's the major assignment instructions. Okay. Uh, yeah, you know what? I think I don't have the Excel spreadsheet, huh? Okay, let me fix that. I'll make it easier. Um, yeah, because you're right, in the assignment, it's got the spreadsheet, what it looks like, right? Interesting. I might have to do a little digging on that. Like it's not hard to duplicate the, the spreadsheet, that's for sure. Um, even if you saw the picture, which is in here, but I did have one that was, that you could just fill out. So I don't seem to see it right now for some reason. Uh, and if you've already done it and you've just duplicated it from the thing, then you're fine. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, Yeah, I'll have to go digging for that. I'm thinking it's if I, let me just see in case it's embedded, maybe it's embedded in the assignment. So let me just see, maybe that's what it was. Uh, okay. Uh, Just looking for it one more time. Where's that assignment? Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, I guess I, I didn't in, uh, I think I meant to link it, but yeah. Okay. All right. So that's referring to, uh, let's go uh, stop share, resume share. Okay, new share. So it's referring to this. Like it's not a big deal in Excel to make this, you know, it's just a series of numbers and the tasks and the weeks above, but I, I'll see if I can find it and just upload it. If anybody's already done it, that's fine. Even if yours looks a little bit different, you've got numbers, task description, durations, and then weeks. And you just put like X's or you fill that in solid with, um, you know, a colored fill. Uh, and that's the this construction schedule. But uh, yeah, I'll take a look at that. And if for some reason I don't have it, I'll quickly make one up. It takes uh, probably five minutes. Tom, our group just had one more quick question. So for number six, when we're doing the section detail based on the Brook drawings, do we have to add any more detail or are we just, we basically draw it at the quarter inch rate, uh, yeah, quarter inch scale, and then just to give the detail that's already there? identify the components on it. Like this is a sill plate. This is the foundation wall, kind of like you see in the, in the tack box details from chapter four. You don't have to do whole paragraphs, but just identify. Yeah, but just little what, arrows and say yeah. like, this is a rafter, this is, okay. Yeah, exactly. All right, great, thank exactly. you. Exactly, exactly. And you know what, if you don't have grid paper and you do it on a sheet and you're using a scale or something to do it, that's fine too. I think you guys are, are doing different sketches and stuff in your probably your course with Nakshab, I would imagine. So again, I'm not making this, I, I just wanna make sure that you kind of have a, a good idea of what you're looking at when you look through the different details. I want you to be applying some of these things that you we've been discussing and learning about and really sort of digging deep to think about them. Okay. Um, so the other thing I wanted to say too was on the presentation, and I think I'll talk a little bit more about the presentation next week, but just to get you um, thinking about uh, the presentation, I would be thinking about uh, with the presentation, trying if you have a camera that works, to try to use that camera during the presentation. I think it makes it a lot more personal um, that way. I understand some people may not be able to do that. Um, that's fine, but I would strongly encourage you to do that because that's how you get better at um, sort of presenting this information. It's also, it makes it a lot more personal that way that um, it's how we get to know each other online when we're using this kind of mechanism. Uh, I, I know in the business world, 90% uh, of uh, people that are interacting at meetings are interacting with a um, camera. Uh, so um, we should try to, uh, at least when we're doing a presentation, do that, or at least when, you know, if possible, when you ask questions too, I would get try to encourage you to do that a little bit more. We're not everybody's on agreement with me on this, like other faculty may not be, but I really think and my experience in the business world is trying to make a personal connection. Even if we have to do it through a video, it's still better that way. You know, I just had a meeting last week with the Mechanical Contractors Association and there was about six of us on the meeting. Everybody's camera was on. And you know what? Some of them I hadn't met before, but now I feel like I know them. But if I don't, if I've never seen the face, I'm not sure that same connection um, is there. It just helps you to better emphasize your point, what you're trying to get across. And also to try to, you know, when you're saying something to look into the camera, if you're talking to the slide, then that's fine. But, you know, at certain points to try to look up and to um, uh, say what it is that you want to get across. It's, it's uh, something that builds your ability so that when you get out there, whether it's in person or whether it's there's this stuff, I don't think it's going to go away now after the pandemic or not. I think there's going to be a lot more um, video conferencing. Do you know how much time is wasted in Toronto with consultants and with uh, subcontractors and that having to travel to a meeting, they're not going to want to sit an hour and a half in traffic if they can just do uh, this for that particular meeting. There's still going to be live meetings and everything, don't get me wrong, but I think there's going to be a lot more of this when things settle down. So 
uh, just because it is a pretty efficient way of doing that. Uh, and that meeting I was at last week, you know, three of them said, yeah, if this was in the, if this wasn't uh, during the pandemic, we probably wouldn't be able to make this meeting because we'd be too busy to drive where you would be having the meeting. So um, it's just trying to build up those kind of uh, skill sets on, on that aspect. You know what? So I know some people do not like to present, whether you're on camera, whether you're, uh, you know, in person, probably in person even more so. Uh, that can be a, a fear, but over time, you know what, the more you do it, the better you get. And one of my favorite uh, leaders um, who has who had their own issues, um, uh, to be sure, was uh, Winston Churchill. And when I was reading this book on uh, presenting, they listed this uh, presentation that he did in like 1908 uh, when he was elected to parliament. And he, he had to do this presentation and he forgot his lines, he forgot the speech and he was like a, uh, a babbling guy up there and the newspapers jumped all over him. This Winston, young Winston Churchill is mentally inept, not suitable for parliament, right, in the headlines. So he made a vow to himself after that, that he was going to get good at presentations. And he was already good at writing, but he wasn't good at presentation. He worked at it, he worked at it, he worked at it, and then became one of the best uh, speech givers of the 20th century. By the time World War II rolled around, he was the right person for the right job. Steve Jobs was not very good in the early days of doing presentations. Some of his earlier presentations were horrible. Worked very hard, but before he would do a presentation on the iPhone or the iPad, worked weeks on it to get really good at that process. And over time, he became known as one of the best presenters going. Um, so it doesn't matter where you are in the spectrum. Um, and this is uh, school, and I'm pretty easy going with that, that aspect. So you don't have to be all stressed out about it, right? So uh, and uh, if anybody, if anybody wants to laugh at you, they should look in the mirror because they got lots of problems themselves. So um, I wouldn't put undue stress on yourself about this um, and just, but try to prepare, try to take some time with it. I'm expecting all kinds of uh, technological problems myself with this. We'll figure it out, okay? So um, that's, um, that's where I'm at with that. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, hopefully that's helping with some of your questions. And you know what? I'm gonna spend some time on Wednesday with this too for the other uh, assignment. And so if there's something uh, lagging from this that you want to tie into that, that's fine. Because I think a lot of them are very similar. It's just it's a commercial project and it's this one doesn't have the schedule and all that. Uh, the Wednesday one's a little bit less uh, involved than this one overall, because this one um, uh, carries a little bit um, uh, more of the uh, mark, if I remember. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, things, similar things going on. Now, the last thing I just wanted to say, I said it at the beginning, is if there are people that have not contacted your group and they seem to be AWOL uh, and all of a sudden, you know, this is what happens the two nights before the uh, presentation is due and the assignment is due, uh, there's this desperate uh, person trying to get into the group. Well, you know what, they didn't do anything up to this point and you have nothing for them to do and to participate in, to say, sorry, you'll have to talk to Mr. Stevenson and he'll um, talk to you about it, right? And so then I'll have to figure out something. Uh, there's a few, I, I am quite sure that, remember I said that there's some people that probably aren't in the course. Uh, yeah, there are, but there's not a lot of them. Actually, I, I'd say retention in this course is very, very high. Uh, higher than if we were in person, because I can tell by who wrote the midterm, right? So who didn't write it and who wrote it? And there's a lot of people that wrote it. So uh, likely there, but there seems to be a lot of group members that wrote it that aren't contacting other group members. Why? I don't know. Uh, so I'll have to deal with that um, at some point with those particular individuals. Unfortunately, I guess that's kind of my mess to deal with um, that way. Okay. So maybe if, um, yeah, and so what do we got? Uh, reminder to upload the questions for the quiz in the midterm. Yeah, I'm not gonna, the quiz and, oh, to, uh, oh, yeah, the, the upcoming quiz, Arsalan, yeah. I've, I'm a little bit behind on that, so that might not happen till Wednesday. The midterm exam, the questions with the answers probably won't come up for another couple of weeks, because again, I've got a, a few laggards I've got to deal with before I 
um, post that part of it. But yeah, I'll try to get the quiz questions for this week up soon. Okay, so does that bring us up to date? <laughs> I think so. And uh, so that's good. So I'll see everybody on Wednesday. And before you, you know, fire off an email with a, a question. If it's something that I've answered or in the, the video, make sure you've checked that before, you know, uh, that way I don't get 400 emails. <laughs> um, not that I'm discouraging you, but you can ask questions, but uh, sometimes I think it's, it's so easy to do, right? Austin? Uh, yeah, um, I know you said you were gonna talk about this on Wednesday, but number nine um, of the rubric, putting the photos and noting changes that take place. Um, can you just kind of describe that a little bit? Because well, there's because there's four houses. Sorry, go ahead. Well, number nine in this in this today's or in Wednesday's? Uh, no, no, today's class. Today's? Okay, uh, number nine. So let's do it. Uh, number nine. Number nine. Okay, so put the photos and note changes taking place. The present compares your work. Did in part one to the actual houses being built, where in the schedule these houses are in the construction process. Okay, so you did up the schedule over here for the brook drawings. You've been taking house pictures of different houses. So the brook drawing somewhere in it, if it's a house to a house, is your pictures of the foundation work going on. So that would compare to the brook drawing foundation, right? So you're gonna basically um, no changes uh, that have happened over the five weeks and whereabouts this is in the process. And you could compare it to, you know, the brook drawing. This is like activity number 16 in the brook house, except this is this house, right? So similarities, differences. This house is going to be an Eve's house. It's an exterior insulated finish system, stucco. The one in the brook drawings is brick veneer. That's the difference, right? Um, this house has a flat roof. The Brook Drawings has a sloped roof, a uh, cottage roof, those types of things. Um, yeah, no, you do not have to enter any, yeah, okay, that's fine. Does that okay, make sense? Okay, awesome. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. there's just the only, the only, um, I was just kind of, there's four, are we doing this all individually? Everyone does their own? I'm going to mark it one. So I'm going to mark it one. So I would have somebody in the group try to sense the size and put things together that it looks like it's a nice flow and then get the other people to check it that they're happy with it, so to speak. Uh, and if somebody gives you something, well, it's not quite enough detail, maybe you wanna add this. You work collaboratively to try to have a nice uh, project at the end of the day. That's why I'm also trying to say, I don't want somebody that jumps in at the last minute that didn't do anything to be part of the group, right? There's going to be definitely some people that do more than others. And that's, you know, what the way the world kind of spins. And generally, too, when I look at things like the quizzes and the tests, there's usually a big spread. And you can usually tell the ones that typically do the work and the ones that don't. And so that changes the marks there as well. So usually at the end of the day, there is still a pretty good spectrum in grades for those of you that worry about that. Okay, thank you. It's like a house. You've got a house and there's some, you've got some really good subcontractors and you've got this lousy subcontractor and you're trying to, to compensate and um, you might have some rework and re-edits and that sort of thing. Okay, well, if that's it, then I guess um, uh, we're, we're, we're there. Are you comparing your house to the Brook drawings? Yeah, yeah, like I said. You can do that. I'm pretty flexible in this. So I think overall, I'm not gonna be like, there will be a spread in the marks to be sure on this. Cause I'll be able to look at it. I can compare like what's an A plus somebody that put a lot of effort and time. And even if they missed some little item but they did all this other stuff, you know, that'll come out pretty well. And then there's ones that I can sort of see that was just thrown together and like good out of our case, we're on to the next one. It won't be as good a mark. Right. So there's there's that differentiation because I can kind of see it when I see them uh, and I look at them. Right. So, OK, well, if that's it, then uh, we will uh, uh, go on then. All right.
So um, we'll, uh, yeah, you can definitely talk about it over the five weeks of pictures. So I'll see everybody then on Wednesday. Have a good one, Tom. Okay, you too. See everybody. Thanks, see you, Tom. See you Wednesday. Take it easy, Sean. Uh, hey, sir, I just got a question for you. Yeah. Uh, can you add uh, this week's uh, lecture notes on Blackboard, please? Yes. Thank you. Have a good week. Okay. Lecture notes and the video. This video as well. I better put this video too. There's a lot in this.